Thank you, and thank you for having us uh, here today. I am uh, particularly indebted to the corporate leadership that we have present here, and I'd like to take in just a moment a few minutes to introduce them to you. Uh, I am uh, Harriet Myers, and I have the privilege of co-chairing the Leaders Council for Legal Services Corporation, and I will have to say that my co-chair uh, Kenneth Frazier is someone who provides the perfect role model for me as uh, well as all of us who are active in trying to support legal services and its funding because he is an amazing leader and uh, he couldn't be with us today but he's always there helping us uh, with this venture so when you see Ken tell him how much uh, first we missed him but also how great a leader he is and what a role model he is for us. And and the same thing goes for the gentleman that I'm uh, seeing right this minute. John Levy has been such an amazing uh, leader for us and his creation of the Leaders Council has been such a uh, shot in the arm, just what we need to get more than the lawyers involved in uh, this activity, but corporate leaders and members of the community, John Grisham, people of that nature. So John, thank you for that. Uh, now to the panel, it's a stellar group. Uh, we really have the, uh, a perfect threesome here. First, uh, Ivan uh, Fong is Executive Vice President, uh, General Counsel, and Secretary of Medronic, Medtronics. Uh, and he is a member of the Leaders Council, and he has held roles in the Justice Department and also the Department of Homeland Security. In other words, he's helped keep you safe. Uh, he has been uh, a General Counsel of three public companies and he has served on the board of directors of Equal Justice Works, which I'm sure most of you know helps spread the concepts of pro bono and access to justice around the nation. Second, Rena Rice is executive vice president and general counsel for Marriott International. She's held several positions at Marriott for over 15 years. Before that, she led the legal officers at uh, Hyatt Hotels or, and worked with their global leadership in that effort uh, closer to home. And this, this really tells you about her heart and uh, where uh, she is, and that is that she is on the board of trustees for the Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia. Uh, even though she is an incredible corporate leader with the responsibilities she has, she still serves on that board of trustees. She also uh, joined with 160 other leaders in Congress uh, to, or leaders to uh, convey the great needs that we have in legal services uh, funding and to provide uh, the arguments in favor of uh, our representatives and senators supporting legal aid funding. Now, John Schultz is also uh, a leader uh, in our legal services community and an executive vice president and chief operating office officer of Hewlett Packard uh, Enterprise. Uh, he is uh, also on our Leaders Council. John also is past chair of the uh, Corporate Advisory Council for National Legal Aid and Defender Association. Uh, all of us are familiar with the work of that group. Starting in 2017, and now it's an annual tradition. John has inspired his peers, nearly 200 of them, to advocate uh, for more federal funding uh, for people who cannot afford legal services to the poor. So you can see why we wanted Ivan and Rena and John to be with us here today in this forum. They are tremendous, not just corporate leaders, uh, 
really world leaders in terms of their responsibilities, but also uh, stalwart leaders in legal services to the poor. So we want to begin, uh, we're all here in, on Capitol Hill to talk about these issues, and so each of these individuals have taken time away from their incredible schedules to uh, be here, and obviously the uh, rule of law in a uh, constitutional democracy and its support for legal services and access to justice has touched their uh, hearts and minds, and they are here. Uh, and we'd like to n just take a few moments, and could each of you uh, tell us uh, what it was that was a, a defining moment or something that caused your uh, interest in these issues? Ivan. Start. Well, thank you, and thank you, Harriet, and John, and Legal Services Corporation for uh, hosting this important discussion, uh, not only to our country and to the legal community, but as you can see, to the business community as well. I would say I've had many defining uh, moments uh, when it comes to access to justice. I uh, started uh, working or volunteering uh, for a legal aid clinic in law school, doing small claims court work uh, in, in a law firm and in government, and now as an in-house lawyer, I've done death penalty cases, represented pro se litigants, uh, done legal work for community-based nonprofits, um, uh, staffed uh, uh, legal aid clinics, expungement clinics, uh, wills clinics for seniors and veterans. Uh, I've done a lot of um, foster uh, children uh, representation uh, in Minnesota. We have a great organization called the Children's Law Center. And I wanted to describe one matter that actually just surfaced last week. Uh, I got a call from uh, the grandfather of three uh, boys whom I had represented maybe three or four years ago. Uh, their mother had left them homeless. She had had a number of substance abuse and other uh, issues. She really could not take care of these uh, children. At the time, they were something like five and eight and 11. Um, and so I worked with them, represented them, helped them get through the uh, process of uh, getting adopted by their grandfather, uh, um, uh, terminate the mother's parental rights. It was a, it was a quite the journey, but, but we made it through. And uh, I got a call last week from the grandfather um, just to say, you know, we were sitting around at dinner the other night and one of the boys asked, so I uh, wonder how Mr. Fong is doing. <laughs> you know, he was so helpful and, you know, we wouldn't be able to have this family dinner if it weren't for his work. And so he called and said, I just wanted to tell you that, Mr. Fong, that, that you really changed our lives and you know, the, gave me a rundown and the boys you know, playing basketball and playing in the band and going to church and singing in the church choir. And it's just, I said, I'm so glad to hear this and uh, I'm gonna promise I'm gonna come and uh, you know, when the weather gets a little warmer in Minnesota, we'll, we'll go out and uh, go out for a picnic and, you know, re reconnect. So, so there have been many defining moments like that. It's, it's just so rewarding. It's a fabulous story of lives changed. So, Nina. Thank you, Harriet. Well, thank you, Harriet, and thank you all for being here. Ivan, John, being here this afternoon. Um, I'm not sure I have a story that can hold a candle to Ivan's. Um, my involvement has been a little more minor, and I think you, you um, embellished on my service on Legal Aid. Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia is mostly known for the law firm members who are members of the board. And a friend of mine who is a local GC said to me, we need to get involved. We need the corporate community in DC, even though it's relatively small, to have a voice here. And, and I haven't been a member even for a full year yet, but it's been really interesting to see how people respond when you do approach them for things. Um, I will make one comment about my hotel experience, which is if any of you have been to conferences in hotel ballrooms, this temperature will feel very, very familiar to you because we try to freeze everybody out. And my personal crusade on climate change is to get us to tick the temperature up a couple of degrees. Um, so <laughs> we hear you. 
Um, my, uh, defining moment, I was really thinking about this and I thought back to when I was a kid and sat with my dad who was a lawyer on the couch watching the Watergate hearings. And my father really took to heart the fact that our system was going to withstand an enormous threat. I don't think I understood really what was going on, um, but I, what I did understand was the passion with which he watched those hearings and then talked to my sister and to me and to other members of our family about the peril that the American system was in and how the lawyers were actually going to step up and help save it. Um, my father died many years ago. I often think that had he been alive over the past decade, he would have been beside himself over what is going on in this country. But I do think that that core of commitment to what this system stands for and what this country stands for and what the lawyers in this country stand for is something that I hold with me forever. And I think the other thing that always occurs to me, and many of us have pieces of artwork in our offices, whether our home offices or our real offices, um, with the biblical injunction, justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. And I think, again, that is really core to why all of us are here today. Fabulous. John. Well, uh, it's great to see everyone, and thank you for being here. I was reflecting on um, maybe the last time I was able to attend in person, and we did an event uh, at the White House, and I saw so many familiar faces, folks who've been you know, carrying the water for such a long time. It's also great to see so many new faces as, as we continue on this journey. Um, also, a huge thanks to John Levy. Like John Grisham, I have found it incredibly difficult to say no to John, but more importantly, Congress has found it hard to say no to John Levy, and I think we are all better off for, for that. So I'm here um, in, in no small part to a very formative experience as a law student, and it was really the impact of one woman um, uh, in, in that regard. Um, I was in the juvenile law clinic at the University of Pennsylvania, and I had the opportunity uh, to work with a, a brilliant and courageous woman by the name of Lori McKinley, who was then a member of the faculty for that specific clinic and then went on to work in community legal services in Philadelphia. Um, and she had agreed to become the guardian ad litem uh, for an intellectually challenged woman who was living in a community setting and whose mother had petitioned the court to have her sterilized. The mother, all well intended for specific health reasons and the like, saw um, the need to do so, but I think we, uh, many of us know the history that has existed in that community with forced sterilization. I can tell you that um, I witnessed firsthand um, some of the blowback, including press articles that ran that were not particularly flattering of Lori and her work and was clearly sympathetic to her mother. And Lori, without compensation and unflinchingly for seven years, represented Cynthia in that matter. I had the opportunity to work on it for a couple years before sort of moving forward, but remained in contact and following it. It left an indelible print on me in terms of the willingness to take on very difficult subjects for the most vulnerable members of the community when it's not particularly popular to do so and the easy thing to do was simply to let it go. And Lori did an amazing job advocating for Cynthia and for a community that you know historically wasn't the subject of advocacy. And I, I was just so impressed and moved by that that um, you know that stuck with me and I was, um, particularly pleased to be able to honor Lori a few years ago when I was being honored and have her with me at the dinner and be able to tell her story because those are the kinds of folks that inspire that next generation of leaders. She certainly inspired me and I hope what we do here today continues to inspire that next group of leaders to, um, to do the kinds of things that uh, will close this justice gap. 
Right. And as I men mentioned, Rena, during the um, introductions and your participation in this letter writing uh, campaign to the Congress, uh, Obviously, you are very serious about participating in increasing access to justice, and uh, you've been a senior leader now at um, Marriott for many years, and as we mentioned, Hyatt before that, but uh, could you uh, tell us how is it that uh, you instill the same passion that you have in your uh, colleagues, and how is it that you create a culture that you hope will last uh, even after you have moved on? So I'm really proud to say it, it's really not about me. It's about my team. Um, people are involved in a whole variety of organizations that they believe in and that really touch their hearts. I'm also really proud to say that one of the things that we've always looked to do is to involve all members of the department, attorneys and non-attorneys, so I was really fascinated to hear the conversation before about how people in a legal department, whether or not they are attorneys, can participate in pro bono activities and community activities. Um, our department has always stood by two of our company's core values. Those two are serve our world and act with integrity. Um, we've always participated, I would say, in a fairly modest way in pro bono activities. And it was as if something lit a match when George Floyd was murdered in 2020. I think all of a sudden, and we were in the midst of perhaps the worst downturn our industry had ever experienced. Um, and that's when we really relaunched our pro bono program. We watched our department along with the entire industry and all departments in the company lose people, um, even as work volumes increased, and it didn't matter, people said, we need to stand up, we need to talk to each other, we need to band together and to figure out how we support our communities. And the other thing that I love is it's not only in the US that we're doing this. We have teams in Europe, we have teams in Asia, we have teams who support the Caribbean and Latin America, and everybody is finding things that really speak to them. So in the US, we've done work with Welcome.us to help resettle Afghan refugees. We've worked on the expungement project. We've worked on the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project. Over in the, our CALA team, Caribbean Latin America, has been working with the Cuban American Bar Association to assist unaccompanied minors who come into the country. Our teams in Asia have worked to analyze the juvenile justice systems in the various countries where they are to, decide, to really analyze whether those systems are compliant with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so fundamentally, it is about Marriott's commitment to serve our world, whether it's training hundreds of thousands of associates to recognize the signs of human trafficking and to know what to do about it, or to have the company support the efforts of the lawyers and all of our staff in the law department. The other thing that I think is really great about the corporate efforts that we've had is that we've partnered with our outside counsel. We really could not do this on our own, and it has been an incredible uh, journey with some of our most valued external counsel partners to be part of this with them, and we're really grateful because they've made it possible for us to do this work. Thank you so much, and I will have to say that we could have a whole seminar on that topic of involving uh, the partnerships that exist between corporations and outside counsel. So thank you for mentioning that. And Ivan, I am aware that uh, Medtronic uh, views its duty to its employees to uh, cause them to be involved in their communities, to uh, do things that are meaningful. Uh, uh, they're uh, obviously, the assumption is all of their work uh, for the company is uh, important, but also important is being 
good citizens and going beyond just their work. So uh, what uh, we'd like to ask you is how do you uh, give your um, uh, lawyers the confidence that to handle matters that are different from what they would day to day? We, we know what uh, corporate lawyers handle. They generally don't handle, handle fa family law or uh, landlord tenant as we've been discussing. So what do you say to uh, your lawyers to encourage them uh, to handle matters that are outside their usual expertise? Usually those questions are a cause for celebration because they've already indicated that they are interested in doing pro bono and so it's just a matter of how. And so before I answer the question, I, I thought I would um, take a moment to talk about the why. This is the theme, I think, of today's conference, which is why is this topic so important? And as been said before, I think the data show, and you heard about the uh, Legal Services uh, Corporation Justice Gap Study, the ABA uh, research that's been done. I mean, the bottom line is our current system of justice civil and criminal, fails low-income people and families in our country. And so when I talk to our lawyers and our other legal professionals, I talk about the obligation and the privilege that we have to, uh, or the privilege of practicing law that comes with the responsibility to provide pro bono services. It's part of our license to practice law. I talk about the need for pro bono legal services. I talk about how rewarding and, and um, how much they can learn from the experience. Um, but then I close really with this appeal to why the corporate community cares. And it's really because of the need to uphold the rule of law. You know, when people don't have access to justice or even perceive they can't get a fair shake in our court system, that erodes our commitment to equal justice under the law and to the rule of law. You know, and the consequence of this failure of the justice chasm, as has been mentioned, is that it risks causing people to lose faith in our democratic system and our system of justice. And business really relies upon having a stable social system where people do perceive there to be fairness and that it's well-functioning. Um, faith in our system is essential to the rule of law because if people don't get a sense that there's a level playing field, either because they're poor or because they're a person of color, um, that risks one of the bedrock foundations of our democracy. The same rules should apply to both the powerful and the powerless. No one in this country should be denied access to our courts simply because they can't afford a lawyer. So, then once I get them excited about doing this work, you know, the answer is there are so many resources available to help um, in-house lawyers who want to do pro bono, um, starting with pro bono work in their area of expertise. So we have, um, you know, employment lawyers, uh, we have tax and transactional lawyers, we have intellectual property lawyers, we have litigators, you know, in almost all of these areas, there are pro bono programs set up to help um, uh, lawyers um, match with clients who have needs in those areas. Uh, secondly, I say, you know, if you need specialized training, there's usually training to be had. You know, we sponsor numerous lunchtime uh, seminars. Uh, you can we work closely in partnership with the local legal aid uh, groups and other um, pro bono providers. Um, and so we will do training on whatever it is, wills, basic immigration law, landlord, tenant law, so you know, people can learn. And the third thing I say is you know more than you think. <laughs> I have staffed many uh, legal clinics where I think I'd say 90% of what I do, a client comes in, they have something that they got in the mail, they don't understand what it says. Uh, it may be from the Social Security Administration. It may be from their landlord. And just reading the letter or talking to them to figure out what, what it is that's sort of going on in their life um, and making a phone call, writing a letter, 
sometimes just telling the client, you know, this is what you need to do to go through this process. It demystifies, you know, what for a lot of people is just, just a labyrinth, right? It's a, it's a maze and, you know, lawyers sort of are good at reading the process. You, you can go online and figure out what, what you're supposed to do to get to what it is that, you know, the uh, person needs to get. So uh, I tell them, look, you know, you can get the training, you can work in your area of expertise, or, you know, we will help you. You know, you'll be with somebody who knows what they're doing, and you'll learn, and it's a lot of fun. That's amazing. In fact, I wish I could have had a number of uh, law firm leaders, and I have some here, I know, but every law firm leader should hear that speech because uh, it was great uh, in terms of uh, encouraging lawyers who may have that hesitancy to step outside uh, their comfort zone. So thank you very much for that. And uh, John, I know uh, Hewitt Packard uh, also maintains a deep uh, community commitment and uh, encourages pro bono work also. And uh, how do you, as the general counsel, go about creating a culture uh, conducive to those uh, activities? Well, I think my colleagues hit a lot of the high points, and, and uh, you know, as a company with a long-standing focus on advancing the way people live and work, going back to Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, you know, fortunately operate in an environment where, um, you know, I think at the top, the culture has been, you know, established along for a long time. And we certainly do uh, have had a long-running pro bono program. Um, Lots of interaction outside the U.S. About 90% of my team is non-lawyers at this point. Um, uh, more than 50% are outside the country. And so whether it's on legal issues or advocacy around stopping modern slavery in the technology and other industries, responsible supply chain, et cetera, I think there's a tremendous amount of advocacy and activism in some ways um, not having grown up in the 60s, but having obviously grown up close enough to have read, heard, and, and interacted with a lot of people for whom the 60s were a formative year. I do feel like right now we live in a period in which our folks are generally activated. And I don't feel as though the problem is people are apathetic and they don't want to get into the game. I do think that the challenge is of everything else that's happening in their lives today, including things that are still cascading from the pandemic, is the overwhelming factor in whether we can get the level of commitment and folks feel like they can devote the time they need to devote. And so we've been talking about, in our organization, what we call living the good life, and that's really living with purpose and living in harmony, and finding the time to make sure that you are focused on what it means to live with purpose and that you're living in harmony, not just inside of the business context, but across everything that is important to you. And that means not just creating the tools and opportunities for pro bono work or for advocacy work, but really making it clear to people, this may be part of you living with purpose and harmony and really being kind of the full you. Being able to bring your full self to work means being able to find the time to do this type of work and us creating that space. Not just telling you there's an opportunity, not just giving you credit for it, but creating that space so it becomes part of the balance of what you do. That's challenging right now with all of the other things that are happening in people's lives. It's challenging given all of the pressures in corporate America. But I do think it's critical to the long-term success of our organizations. And I think it's really critical to the long-term success of our team members. And so that's what is driving our culture right now to try to take advantage of this period of activism. Right, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna move right along here because um, we have a next speaker behind us. And uh, uh, Rena, I know you all are really good about getting feedback from people who uh, stay at your hotels, and that's important feedback. And uh, we've never done that sort of thing with respect to legal services uh, 
organizations where you go in and talk to the clients that are seeking uh, uh, help in either getting it or not getting it. Uh, what would you like to learn from an exercise like that if we could do it though? What would you be able to so I learn? Think it's, it's great to equate it to what we do in our businesses, which is we seek out user feedback and we you know, go through that iteration process to try to figure out what we can do better and how we can continually improve. Um, are there gaps that we need to pay attention to? What are we doing well that we should double down on? And what are we really, what challenges do we have? I think some of it is storytelling too. And, and when we talk about legal aid clients, um, I, I think what legal aid does really, really well is, is bring it down to individual people that we are serving. I think one of the things, if, if you sort of take a step back and look at the enormity of some of the challenges that we face, it's very daunting. It's easy to throw up your hands and to say, oh my God, you know, how do we even go about solving this? But if you look at what we can do, every journey starts with one step, we serve one person, we really expand from that. We, there's, there's also a degree of, um, I don't know that pleasure is the right, right word, but satisfaction and reinvigoration for each of us, and I think that's important. And I think, you know, to help one person, again, I'll go back to a proverb, is really to, to impact one person's life, I'll paraphrase a little, is really to impact the entire world. You have to start someplace. So I think that's what legal aid and other organizations can really do well. Right. And Ivan, uh, your company is great about innovation. And what we'd like to ask you is uh, uh, just what uh, is it that uh, enables that at your company? And uh, it's pretty clear you put a real emphasis on putting people first. And so could you uh, share with us what can staff and volunteers from legal aid organizations learn from the practice of uh, putting uh, the human factor at the center of everything? It's a critical question. Uh, thank you, Harriet. So I recently finished my first year at Medtronic, and I have an internal blog that I write. And so I wrote about my learnings in my first year. And one of the things I talked about was never underestimate the power of a compelling mission. You know, I've been at many mission-oriented companies, even at the Department of Homeland Security, where I asked people, why did you come to DHS? And most, actually, lawyers said, you know, after 9-11, I wanted to do something to uh, serve my country. At Medtronic, you know, this idea of a mission really permeates. I mean, it's a, it's a real thing. Um, the tenant number one, which people talk about and, and used in decisions uh, at the company, is to contribute to human welfare by application of biomedical engineering in the research, design, manufacture, and sale of instruments or appliances that alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life. And that's very motivating for, for everybody in our legal um, organization. In addition, and people actually do refer to these by tenant number, tenant six talks about the importance of maintaining good citizenship um, uh, in our company, as a, in our community. So the point is having a really powerful mission, to, to John's earlier point about people's need for an attraction to purpose, purpose-driven is, is really, I think, what I would say to the legal services staff to um, wrap your um, uh, uh, people and culture around the client at the other end of everything you do. So at Medtronic, we talk about the patient who is at the other end of every th decision we make. Um, it's great for recruiting and retaining talent. Um, as Rena said, we do a lot of storytelling. You talk about the patients who've, you know, overcome significant health issues as a result of the Medtronic therapy. You know, you ask yourself, can your team quote your mission? Um, do you quote it in meetings? Uh, are there certain values that reflect your culture and, 
uh, help drive decision making. People need to see the impact of what they do beyond the four walls of your organization. They need to be seen and appreciated for what they do. And they need to have a voice in how work gets done, and they need to be able to grow in their careers. So talent development is an important part of making sure that your organization just has a strong culture, not only mission-oriented, but takes care of the talent that you have. And many people may not know that Medtronic also makes sticky notes. And so... <laughs> well, that's 3M. That's, yeah. the, that's the old ghost. <laughs> Prior life. In his former life. Yep. But, but thank you. It would be uh, great if every time we think of a sticky note, we think of what we can do for access to justice. But, um, John, you get the last question, and it, it's... Uh, we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary uh, next year of Legal Services Corporation. And what do you see uh, as we approach that anniversary of uh, what can be done? Uh, uh, what is the connection between business, our rule of law, and civil justice? That would be a good end for our panel. Well, I think if, you know, the rule of law has been central to the prosperity of this country and you know my personal experience being part of a corporation that does business in almost every country in the world is that the rule of law has been a competitive advantage for us. And so the connection between business and the rule of law is, is direct and clear. And if you have any doubts about that, think about how many lobbyists you see in Capitol Hill and in the state capitals around the United States who are trying to influence the law and the regulatory environment. You know, unfortunately, that same support hasn't necessarily been there for access to justice, even though in my mind, the connection is just as direct and just as clear. If our communities or large portions of our community don't believe the system is fair, they think it's stacked against them, the consequences are dire, and we have seen countless of examples of that across the last few years. However, I think the solution here is not a legal solution. It involves not just business, but government leaders and influencers and media, and that is to stop thinking about this as a legal rights issue and think about it as a fundamental human rights issue. We need to treat access to justice the same way we have thought about the right to health care in this country. We took on the cause of the underinsured and the uninsured. We now need to take on the cause of the underrepresented and the unrepresented in the legal space. We will not. We will not solve this access to justice crisis without a comprehensive legislative solution. And therefore, I really valued and appreciated Senator Cardin's remarks. Because I believe as we approach the 50th anniversary of LSC, and as inspiring as all of the things that we are doing as a community, as they are, I fear it is not enough. And so I think as we go into this 50th year, together, we have to become an even louder voice demanding at the federal and state level a legislative solution to the equal access to justice gap. We need to guarantee people the right to access to justice the same way we guarantee the right to health care. I think that needs to be where we put our focus because otherwise, I think we will just continue to see this crisis grow. Thank you, and join me in thanking this uh, incredible panel of uh, corporate leaders.